Hello, everybody, and welcome to our R2V3 read alongs. Today um, on schedule, we will be talking about core requirements, nine facility requirements. Um, and we will um, have a uh, same format where Asal is going to read the standard and Mike and I will um, chime in when there is any additional discussion needed. Uh, Asal is going to ask follow-up questions. And so let's just uh, dive in, Asal. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, so today we're talking about section uh, core requirement nine, facility requirements, and the general principle is to process and store electronic equipment, components, and materials in a manner that is legally compliant and protects the health and safety of workers, the public, and the environment. So this core requirement here kind of combines two of the provisions uh, from the R2 2013, the storage, provision, which was either uh, 9 or 10, I forget. One was security, one was storage, and then uh, provision 11, which was uh, insurance, closure plan, and financial assurance. So uh, this part here is uh, pretty much similar to what you have in R2 2013 in regards to storage. It's a little bit uh, more detailed, um, and it has things that are from the, from the new uh, R2 standard, R2 V3. Okay, so we're going to jump into um, uh, section A. An R2 facility shall conduct all processing operations indoors unless the risk of the outdoor operations have been assessed and controls established to prevent uncontrolled releases to the environment. So th this is a little bit more descriptive than it was before, but it also says processing operations. So it's not like necessarily storage, then that's an important part. So processing operations would be like you're shredding material outside or you're like dismantling CRTs outside, which maybe that's what people are going to do in the uh, COVID environment. <laughs> but who knows what's more important, the health and safety of workers or re minimal releases to the environment. Anyways, uh, this is basically only saying that processing operations should be done indoors. It doesn't talk about, um, unless, and then you could do it outdoors if you assess the con and have controls to prevent uncontrolled releases to the environment. So if you have a huge shredder that needs to be outside and it has a, like a, a you know, uh, some type of device, you know, dust bag or whatever, you know, to collect all of the uh, material, any particulates that would be released to the air, then that's permissible to do outside if you've assessed and did what you need to do to show that the controls are in place to prevent uncontrolled releases to the environment. Okay, good. Um, so section B, well, now we talk about storage. An R2 facility shall store all R2 controlled streams in a manner that, one, protects them from reasonably, reasonably foreseeable adverse weather conditions, Two, in accordance with the established legal compliance plan. Three, provides security from unauthorized access. And four, is clearly labeled, con is in clearly labeled containers um, or storage areas. This is very similar to the storage provision under R2 2013. It just specifically adds the store all to uh, all R2 controlled streams, which makes that um, a little bit more narrow than what it was under uh, the previous version of the standard. So R2 controlled streams would be like untested material, stuff that still has potential data on it or focused material, focused material bearing equipment here. Um, so stuff basically that needs to be processed or needs to be sent downstream for material recovery or some type of uh, repair, refurbishing. Um, so uh, it doesn't include metal, plastic, cardboard, stuff that is not focused material, so, or focused material bearing. So uh, basically that doesn't, it doesn't mean that you can't store plastic bales outside or, um, you know, metal in a roll-off bin. 
you know, this, but it, it doesn't absolve you from having to store other material in a legally compliant manner, right? Because you still have to comply with all legal requirements. So you. Exactly. So, I mean, you still, um, you know, if you have material stored outside, uh, then you're prob then you're going to be covered by the stormwater permit. And if you're covered by the stormwater permit, you have to assess, you know, your potential pollutant areas and put a best management practice, put best management practices in place to prevent, you know, contamination to stormwater, whether that's tarping uh, roll off bins during or before prior to rain, or having some type of stormwater treatment system at your facility or, or whatever other um, management uh, control you have in place. In uh, section C, says that an R2 facility shall store all equipment destined for reuse in an enclosed environment protected from the elements unless intended for outdoor use. So that kind of goes along with what you were saying with regards to outside storage. Um, yeah, so I mean, the, the, so the R2 controlled stream uh, uh, are the stuff that hasn't been processed you know, in regards to like material that needs to be tested or repaired or uh, sanitized or it's, you know, just focused materials. Whereas the uh, all reuse material uh, destined for reuse would be like stuff that's already tested and, you know, has a categorization made in terms of uh, cosmetic condition and functionality condition. So this stuff is going for a reuse stream. And of course that, you know, for electronics, you want to store them in an environment that protects them from the elements, right? So um, otherwise they could be damaged by that. So I think this is probably not something that people tend to do anyways. Uh, but as, as we've mentioned several times, the standard is very prescriptive in the way that it describes things. So it's just kind of covering all situations here. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to add on to this. First of all, can you guys hear any background noise from me? No. Yeah, if you do, I want to apologize for ahead of time. That's what happens when you are in a pandemic and you have to do all of this from home. Um, so um, there might be some background noise today. So, um, but with that said, I think, so yes, Mike is right. This is after it's processed and ready for reuse. And I think this has to do with preserving the quality of the product, right? So um, in one of the things in um, ISO 9001, it talks about that you have to preserve uh, the, pro the storage, right? When you're storing the product, you have to preserve the quality or the uh, of the product. And so that's why I think the reuse, um, the items that are tested and ready for reuse, the idea is that you want to store it in a manner that protects it to, you know, to make sure that it's not damaged. So you, when you are, when you do sell it, um, that there's no returns uh, to you. So minimize RMAs, return material authorization. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, 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 you know, would benefit the, the organization anyway from having reduced amount of damage to finished um, goods. Um, any final thoughts on this before we get into the insurance requirements? Nothing from me. Uh, the general principle for, for the insurance requirement is possess insurance that is appropriate to cover the potential risks and liabilities associated with the nature and size of the operation. So this is different now because the um, previous uh, R2 2013 said, you know, that people had to have, you know, consider pollution insurance and it was pretty much required unless you could show that you didn't need it and you need to have like, uh, you know, a, an assessment done by like a professional engineer or some other qualified person. So this is just uh, talking about insurance here and the uh, actual requirement for pollution insurance is in the materials recovery process requirements now. So section D um, says the R2 facility shall demonstrate that it has evaluated the risks related to the scope of its operations 
including any changes in operations and volume of material processed, and that it has used that evaluation to obtain insurance or reserves that it can demonstrate is appropriate to cover liabilities arising from all activities and locations in which it operates. So this also suggests that, you know, maybe pollution insurance is required under here. It just specifically doesn't mention it. So when you evaluate the risk of your operation, if you're doing stuff outdoors or you're doing events or you have, you know, a lot of trucks that are on the road, then maybe it's appropriate for you. I mean, obviously you have to have automobile uh, insurance. If you have your own trucks, you have to have workers' comp insurance. You have general liability. Plus, maybe if you're moving material around a lot, it is advantageous for you to have pollution coverage. So, I mean, you have to, and I think this is more of a, the high level risk rather than like the risk assessment uh, included in like your occupational health and safety hazards identification. This is a little bit higher level risk uh, assessment here. Um, and so, and it might also go with like the, the change management process in determining like what the size of your operation is and what type of insurance is necessary for you um, uh, as a recycler or R2 facility to have in place. Insurance or reserves shall include one, coverage for treatment of work-related injury and illness of workers, and two, any process insurance requirements specified elsewhere in this R2 standard. So yeah, I mean, obviously you have to have uh, work, workers comp um, as required under one, but that's required, it's regulatory required anyways, right? And then the second one, any process insurance requirements specified elsewhere in the R2 standard. So I believe aside from pollution insurance under materials recovery, there was also something in regards to specific insurance that was required for brokers under Appendix F. But um, the, o the only one that I'm certain of is the, the pollution insurance under materials recovery, which I believe is Appendix E. Yeah. And again, we're, we're going to go through the appendixes as well. Um, so, you know, please check out those videos um, to get more specified uh, information. Any final thoughts with regard to insurance? If not, we're going to move um, to legal and financial assurance. The general principle here is to have legal and financial assurances in place for the proper closure of its facility. So this is um, a basically a closure plan, correct? Yes. Section E, an R2 facility shall develop and maintain a current written plan that provides for the closure of the facility in the event of abandonment. So this is an important point. I mean, um, the event of abandonment uh, is a key element because a lot of people's closure plan, a, a lot of our R2 facilities closure plans that I've seen, uh, they have the closure plan like the, the facility is going to close the facility down. You know? Yeah. So that's, I mean, if you're abandoning, abandoning the facility, then you're not around to do it. So it's yeah. important <laughs> to think about who is going to, who's going to do that. Who's, who has the money set aside to close the facility in case of abandonment? Yeah, and it, it, in the case of abandonment, obviously your closure costs are going to be much higher than, than if you did a planned wind down and closure. So I think the purpose here is to cover the worst case scenario, is to have enough financial insurance to cover the worst case scenario, which is a situation where the management uh, just walks away. Exactly, right? yes. Yes. Um, so now we're going to get into the um, requirements that have to be in the plan. The plan shall include one, uh, sorry, the plan shall one, include the use of appropriate commercial businesses to manage any electronic equipment, components, and materials under the R2 facilities control. Include the appropriate use, uh, include the use of appropriate commercial businesses to manage any kind of electronic equipment components and materials under the R2 facilities control. So 
think this is just saying that uh, where it's going to go to has to be a appropriate commercial business that can manage those things. So you have to show that they are able to receive the material, that they can process the material that you're going to send to them, that they're qualified to kind of receive that. So would this be somebody like your competitor then, or would that be somebody like your downstream vendor? I think it could be some of both. I've seen, but I've seen people kind of um, give a lot of the material that they have in their closure plans to people that are competitors that they kind of do work with because they're close by and it would be easy uh, to transport the material there. They're doing the like type of uh, activities as the R2 facility. So, I mean, it could be either. Two, um, the plan shall consider the risks identified, including equipment and materials that could be received under the R2 facilities certification scope and applicable law. So consider the risk identified, including equipment and material that could be received under the R2 facility certification scope. So this is kind of just like what type of material, what are your material streams, what are you receiving? Um, are you handling CRTs? Are you handling PCB and PCB containing equipment? Um, and what is what is the law? How how um, you know how long can are they hazardous waste, universal waste? How long can you store them? What what is the necessary disposal of these types of materials? So all of those risks have to be considered in the closure plan, like when you're putting together an inventory possible inventory of what the facility, uh, the capacity is. The plan shall include reasonably foreseeable costs in the financial instrument for processing remaining inventory, sampling for environmental contamination, and possible site remediation to restore the premises to sellable condition. So yeah, all of this stuff is very similar to what was in R2 2013. Uh, this one is a little bit more similar language in uh, E1 and 2. The way that it's worded is differently, but I think the same intent is here, right? You have to be able to identify, like, who's going to manage the material um, after, you know, in the case of an abandonment, you know, what type of material stream is that going to be? Uh, what's the cost of the potential inventory on site? What kind of sampling do you need to do? And um, what other type of remediation might be uh, necessary for your site? And that all depends on your operation, uh, what type of material you process, and how you process it. So this is not, this is not anything new. It's just worded in a different way. I think the, the closure plan is still going to look very much similar to what it looked like under R2 2013. The plan shall, in five, the plan shall include any process or other closure requirements specified elsewhere in this R2 standard. Did we skip uh, four? Establish a financial instrument necessary for the funds of closure, including in the event of abandonment, consistent with applicable law and the closure plan. So I think that, that I mean, this is a, a part that um, was required before. So um, it just adds that again, including in the event of abandonment. So that's important that the financial instrument um, is uh, basically assigned to somebody who can carry out the closure activities in case of an abandonment. So you would have to add, like maybe have, um, when you're calculating the cost, would have to add cost for administrating the closure. Yeah. Abandonment. People don't want to work for free, right? Yeah. Sorry, I skipped four. Uh, any no, thoughts? it's okay. <laughs> but okay, so any, I'm going to, I'm going to, before I move on to section F, any. Uh, final thoughts on uh, the requirements for the closure plan? No, I think it's very similar, but it is more prescriptive again. So it kind of details, I think it's good to, to the prescriptiveness here is good because it says it lays out more clearly what is required of a closure plan. So now you're not getting just these 
closure plans that have no value to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's and the... Sorry. Go ahead, Go ahead um, Mike. I also think, honestly, in terms of prescriptive, right? So what um, we've been also seeing that a lot of auditors, for example, for um, R2 from certification bodies do not have, a, and even consultants do not have as much experience in the actual industry, uh, recycling, uh, electronic recycling industry. So R2 standard being this prescriptive is really giving actually the auditors more direction as to what to look for, what is really required and what is like, mm, okay, up to the organization to, um, to implement, right? So, um, and I think that we're going to see that in the next section, section F, um, where, you know, some auditors may be asking for a closure plan, closure plan when, you know, um, it might not make sense, right, in the past. So that's why I think it's a good thing that this, uh, there's parts of the standard that are more prescriptive. Mm -hmm. And speaking of F, um, the F says the financial instruments to assure closure in the event of abandonment are not required if, one, the total cost to properly close the facility in the event of abandonment is less than 10,000 United States dollars. Two, the size of all buildings owned, leased, or used by the R2 facility is less than 1,000 square meters. And three, the facility prohibits and never accepts equipment or material containing mercury, CRT glass, lithium, primary batteries, or polychlorinated biphenyls. So I like this. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> oh. So um, I would say uh, initial thought uh, would be here, uh, brokers, mm -hmm. right? So there are certain brokers that are working from home offices, and they don't even touch the material or they have shared warehouses just for cross dock operations, right? So yeah. you do really need to have a closure plan in case of an abandonment. Uh, that's the question. And so. then I think also what falls into this is like small cell phone refurbishing operations because um, the costs, once they do, the cost is probably going to be less than $10,000. Uh, the size of all buildings owned, leased, or used by the facility is probably going to be less than a thousand square meters, which they put square meters because obviously uh, the whole world except for the U.S. uses that. But for us in America, that means 10,763 square feet because I had to look it up. I was like, I don't know what square meters means. Um, so a lot of those cell phone refurbishers are, uh, have facilities that are less than 10,000 feet, uh, square feet as well and that they don't process equipment that contains mercury, uh, CRT glass, lithium primary batteries are polychlorinated biophenols. So look at the focus materials that are missing from that. You know, the main focus materials you'll see in a cell phone are gonna be the circuit boards and the lithium ion batteries. So uh, I think this is the perfect, it's the kind of exception for the small cell phone refurbisher that's just, you know, bringing in good, grade A, grade B phones that, you know, really don't cause or are not, there's not much um, risk of if they're abandoned, that it's going to be like a huge thing because they're still like usable phones. So they have value to them. It's not like a negative cost, like a bunch of CRT glass in a, a, a hundred thousand square foot facility that's going to cost million dollars to clean up or something. Um, can we, I just want to clarify that this section F says that the financial instrument is not required, but the yes. closure plan is still required, right? Uh-huh. Okay. Good. That's a good point. Yeah. To distinguish. So they still have to have a closure plan. They just don't have to have a, a financial instrument demonstrate that a financial instrument is in place for the closure. Mm -hmm. Any closing thoughts on the facility requirement section of the new R2 standard? Core requirement. I like the fact that they took uh, 
pollution insurance out and that they provided for small facilities that really don't need to have a closure plan, uh, that requirement out. So, I mean, it's good that the core requirements don't have those things. And if you're doing certain processing that would require you to have that, it's in the process requirements only and not in the core requirements. So I think that's a good addition. Maya, any thoughts? No, I think I, the, me talking earlier about it being more prescriptive, I think that's, that's all. Well, thank you uh, for joining us today uh, for core requirement number nine. You've made it this far, so please uh, continue to watch uh, the next core requirement 10. Uh, we will talk about transportation. And please um, also check out the um, appendix uh, requirements uh, discussions as well. Um, and yeah, thank you for joining us. Have a great day. Yeah, see you next Bye. week. Bye.